The scriptures from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 through 23. You may read along in your Bible or if you wish in the Pew Bible in the New Testament on page 172. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Amen. In honor of Ed's first Sunday back in the pulpit after the tragedy of his family, let me just say that we are going to get out of church today at about the same time Ed used to let us get out of church. <laughs> because I'm not good enough to abbreviate what I've prepared to say. So please just sit and listen to it all for me. <laughs> I have learned, this is the good news, I have learned the best way to study the Bible. And here it is. Listen, take notes if you need to. Step one, agree to stand before a group of your very favorite people in the world 
and bring a message from God. I thank God for what I have learned in preparing for this lesson. I stand amazed at how he was able to show me things that I needed to know. I don't have time to share them all with you. I will also tell you that I stand before you today with sore feet because God and Paul stepped all over my toes this week sharing with me what to say. Please pray with me. Father, may we each hear today what you would have us to hear. Amen. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand these rights? We have rights. The right to due process, trial by jury, to face our accusers, to bear arms. We have rights. And we have freedoms. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, assembly, petition, religion. We have freedoms. And we have ways. The way we do things around here. The way we've always done it. And a favorite in our family, their ways are not our ways. <laughs> oh, we have ways. At a parent-teacher conference when our daughter was in elementary school, I asked her teacher for help. I explained that sometimes when I helped Jennifer at homework, that, you know, I would read the assignment or I would read the story to her. And then when I asked her questions about what I had read, sometimes she would look back up with me, at me with this blank stare because she didn't know the answers. So I asked the teacher how to help me with that, and she said, Miss Acock, let me ask you a couple of questions. She said, do you make sure you're in a distraction-free area? Oh, yes, ma'am, I do. No TV, no radio, it is quiet. We are in a dis distraction-free zone. And she said, do you have Jennifer sit still and be quiet so she can hear what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. And I keep her close enough to me that if she starts to get a little fidgety, I can reach over and put my hand on her leg calm her back down and the teacher said I think I see the problem she said Miss Acock I know that's probably the way you enjoy reading and you enjoy learning but if Jennifer has to sit still and be quiet she has to think about sitting still and being quiet and then she can't think about what you're reading to her so I tried an experiment that night that the teacher suggested I knew it wasn't going to work because I knew my little girl but I did it anyway. Homework time, I let Jennifer go pick out a toy. She picked a doll. We got in our little distraction-free zone, and she started combing that doll's hair, and I started reading. And I got to the end of the story, and I had no idea what I had read because Jennifer's play was so distracting to me. But Jennifer knew every answer, and I learned a valuable lesson. Jennifer didn't learn the way I learned. And my way was not going to work for her. We have ways, and we have freedoms, and we have rights. How set are we in our ways? And how loudly do we express our freedoms? And how demanding are we of our rights? And how do our answers to those questions affect our relationship with others? especially those to whom we are called to minister. Paul addressed these questions and other issues in his letter to the Corinthians that we read from this morning. Now, Corinth was a wealthy cosmopolitan center of Greece with over 700,000 people, big city. It had become a perverse environment of immorality, and on Paul's second missionary journey, he spent about a year and a half there in Corinth building this church. Today, we're reading a little bit of a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in response he received from a, the leaders of that church after he left. A letter asking for his help in settling some disputes within the church. In chapter 8, 
Paul addresses the dispute of food sacrificed to idols and whether or not it was okay to eat it. Now Paul reminds them that among believers of a church, there are different levels of understanding. So he tells those more mature Christians, I know that you understand there is one God. And I know you understand that idols are nothing at all and that as a Christian we no longer sacrifice to those idols. So you are certainly free to eat those foods. But he says, listen, we know that food does not bring us nearer to God and we are no better or worse whether we eat it or not. But be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul goes on to share exactly how strongly he believes what he's saying. Paul says, Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Paul believed that guiding a younger Christian, a less mature Christian, to a better understanding was more important than his freedom to eat certain foods. And Paul was willing to deny himself anything to be an effective missionary. In chapter 9, Paul further explains his strategy of self-denial. He speaks to his choice to not be financially compensated for his ministry endeavors. It was certainly customary for him to be paid. He was entitled to compensation. But for his own reasons, he chooses not to. And I'm going to choose to address that again in a few minutes. In our scripture for today, Paul describes how this flexible strategy of self-denial opened doors for him and helped him to be an effective missionary as he moves among, the, among people of different backgrounds and cultures and beliefs. In verse 19, where we started reading today, Paul tells his church family at Corinth and First Baptist Fayetteville that he is free and belongs to no man. Now Paul is free. He's free in several ways. Just being born a Roman citizen came with lots of rights and freedoms. And he's free because he's not indebted to anyone who would have been paying him. He's also free because he's not married. I'm sure most of you married gentlemen would agree that more of Paul's time and attention and energy was freed up because he didn't have a wife at home waiting with a honey-do list. But the more important freedom that Paul is probably referring to here is his freedom from the rigid requirements of the old law, the Mosaic law. He's free from the unachievable task of earning his way into God's favor by following a lot of rules. He's talking about the freedom that Jesus brought to him and bought for him on Calvary. After Paul tells us he's free, he immediately tells us that he makes himself a slave to everyone. And he tells us why. He does it to win as many as possible. To bring as many people as possible into the freedom of Christ's new covenant of love and forgiveness. You see, that's what was missing from the old law, a way to forgiveness. God knew we couldn't live up to those high standards, that we would fail, and that we would need forgiveness. So he sent us his son to live among us, serve as an example, and pay our way. That was the goal of Paul's ministry, to show people the way to God through Christ's plan of love and forgiveness. Now let me interject here that our pastor told us on a recent Wednesday night study, if when reading the Bible, you come across a word or a phrase that's repeated over and over, then you might want to pay attention because it's probably important. Our lesson today comes from one paragraph that's made up of seven sentences. Six of those sentences include some phrase, some version of the phrase to win, to win as many as possible, to win the most, to gain the more. I think that's important. Paul tells us how he does this. He does it with that flexible plan of self-denial. When necessary, Paul surrenders his rights and his freedoms and his ways to guide others. 
In verse 20, Paul says, to the Jews, I become like a Jew which was probably pretty easy for Paul since he was born to Jewish parents. So when he visited in Jewish communities, he was able to talk like them and eat like them and dress like them. And his hope was that choice of his would tear down barriers and earn their trust so that they could hear his message. He was building relationships. In studying for today, I came across the story of Hudson Taylor. Mr. Taylor was a real go-getter kind of missionary. He went to China. He was often compared to Paul um, because of his tactics, because of his choices. He discovered, though, early on in his travels in China that he was such a novelty. The people of China were more interested in his clothes and in his manners than in his message. And his solution to that dilemma was to become Chinese. He adapted his ways to their ways. He began to dress like them and observe some of their cultural practices. Some of the other Protestant missionaries of the time thought that he was being a little too radical. He'd moved a little too far away from the normal missionary way of doing things. But to him, he was just following Paul's example. He was just adapting to the culture of the people to whom he was ministering. Paul even practiced this self-denial among the Jews who were still living under the law. Those who, still be those who believed they could earn their way into heaven by following the rules. Paul was aware that if he showed up in a Jewish synagogue to eating a BLT, he might not be well received. And then how could he possibly teach them about Jesus and the new covenant? So Paul was willing to give up his right to a good BLT if it opened a door for him to preach. In verse 21, Paul moves on to, the, to ministering to the Gentiles, those not living under the law. Now Paul had to be a little more careful here. He could eat with them and he could join in their traditions, but he had to be careful not to give the impression that he was lawless or immoral. Paul's little parenthetical note here in verse 21 is really important. He says when he become he, he said when he says he becomes as one outside the law he's not talking about being outside of God's law he would never want to do anything contrary to Christ's example but like he did with the Jews he would observe their cultural practices up to a line but he would not cross that line into immoral behavior but he would still do what he needed to do to win his Gentile friends to Christ. In verse 22, Paul tells us, To the weak, I become weak. Guess why? To win the weak. Who are these weak people? Paul is likely referring to those he was talking about back in chapter 8. Those who were in the church, but had not yet come to a full understanding of the new truths that Jesus taught. Those who struggled with things like eating food once sacrificed to idols. Paul tells the strong to be gentle with the weak, to be patient with them, to guide them as they are ready and as they are comfortable. Now I want you to try a little experiment with me. I want you to cross your arms. Everybody cross your arms. Now, take note of how your arms are crossed. Which arm is on top? Are your hands tucked? Like, see, I tuck my left, my left hand, but my right hand is open around my arm. Notice how your hands are. Notice how your arms are. Now, uncross your arms. Now, I want you to cross them the exact opposite way. Different arm on top, different hand tucked. For most of it, well, some people can't do it as I'm looking out here. For most of us, this is a little uncomfortable because we're not accustomed to doing it this way. We're accustomed to doing it the other way. Change is not always easy. We certainly understand that when we're the ones struggling with a change. Now, I won't speak for you, but I know that I am not always as patient as I should be when I'm struggling a little bit, coming around to a new idea. I'm not always patient with other people when they're trying to come to a new idea that I already like. 
Paul sums up his strategy of self-denial in verse 22, where he says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Forgoing his own rights and freedoms and ways, Paul submitted to the ways of other cultures so that by all means he might bring some to Christ. He met people where they were physically, culturally, and socially, and he built a relationship with them. And why does he do that? In verse 22, he says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. Now, this is where I want to go back just a minute to Paul's choice to not being paid for preaching. Paul tells us earlier in the letter that he felt compelled to preach. He even said, woe is me if I don't. And he says his reward is that he can do it voluntarily. Paul counts that as a blessing in his life. Paul was passionate about his ministry, and he had a great story to tell. He also had a dramatic conversion. I mean, come on. Why wouldn't he be passionate about sharing how his heart was changed? Look at his story. We read it back in Acts when Paul, then known as Saul, was at the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, a servant of God. And Saul stood there and gave approval to this violent murder. Saul was part of the great persecution that broke out that day against the church of Jerusalem. Saul went door to door and dragged out men and women who believed in Jesus and put them in prison. And then under the authority of the high priest, Saul headed to Damascus looking to find anyone there who believed in Jesus and put them in prison too. But on his way to Damascus, Jesus changed Saul's plan. It was a bright light from the heaven, and he was blinded. And Jesus called his name and said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Talk about a dramatic conversion. No wonder Paul is so passionate about spreading Jesus' message of love and forgiveness. Jesus made a believer out of him. And Jesus made a believer out of me too. Only there was no bright light from the heaven. And I was not on a journey to, with a plan to hunt down and imprison Christians. I was a little 10-year-old girl in, ba in Bible school at Greenwood Baptist Church in Florence, South Carolina. And I never remember not believing in Jesus. Now, I've probably not always walked as close to God as I should have. But I've never lost my way in any large sense that would give me this great dramatic testimony. I grew up in a loving home with parents who will celebrate their 64th wedding anniversary this year. Two brothers and a dog. Both sets of my grandparents were married till death did they part. And I met my husband at church. So is it any wonder that my passion for sharing Jesus may not be as strong as Paul's. Yes, my friends, it is a wonder. Because it's not about Paul's story of bad turned good. And it's not about my blessed, simple, drama-free childhood. It's about people who need help and love. And it's about Jesus and his life and death and resurrection is dramatic enough. It's about God's new covenant of love and forgiveness. That's enough. Paul had the opportunity to be God's messenger to governors and kings and also to prisoners. He spent time with apostles and religious leaders. He ministered to mature Christians and the weak. He was beat up, locked up, shackled, and finally killed because of his drive to become all things to all people so that he could share Jesus. Because other people's salvation was important to him, Paul took advantage of every opportunity he was given to share God's message. What opportunities are we given? 
Do we see them? Al and I have been given opportunities to show God's power of peace in the almost five years since Alan's death. Please, please do not misunderstand me here. We do not for one minute believe that God took Alan at age 30 so we would have a story to tell or even so that we could help others. But we do thank God for giving us the strength and the opportunity to take our loss our sadness, our grief, and help others see God's hope and peace. Just as he brought people like this church into our lives to guide us through the struggles of Alan's illnesses and then his death, he has brought friends to us since who can benefit from that experience. As Christ's followers, we all have the opportunity to meet people where they are, and build relationships like this church does while visiting and worshiping at the VA nursing home, or serving breakfast at Operation In As Much, or helping our neighbors clean up after a hurricane. Relationships are also built right here within these walls through both our Blessings Boutique and certainly in our church office every day. Just a new shirt or a new suit or just a bottle of water and a pack of crackers offered with a warm heart and a smile may be the first step in building a relationship. Friends, we were created in the image of God and given the amazing gift of free will. We can make our own decisions, our own choices, good or bad, even to disobey God. We decide if we are going to follow the great commission we read in Matthew where Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. Paul was determined to do this by all possible means. What means are we willing to take? We have the right to remain silent. Let's not. Amen. Amen. I was reading my uh, program a while ago and I saw benediction and charge. I never saw that word before in here that I knew of. So I asked Brother Rob what that meant. And so he told me. So now I know what charge is. What I knew the definition of one charge, but I didn't know what his definition was. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the honor of coming to your house to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you give us day in and day out. We thank you, Lord, for being so loving and caring for us, Lord. And since you're so caring and loving for us, let us pray that we will be loving and caring to other people like you ask us to do, Lord. In fact, you command us to love our neighbor. And I pray, Lord, that we will, this week, that we will look around and look for those that need help and help them, Lord, because there are so many out there. And... Jesus tells us, you know, the rich will take care of themselves, but the poor, they can't. So it's our job to take care of them. And I pray that you'll give us strength to do these things that you ask us to do. And thank you, Lord, for this beautiful sermon that we just heard. And we'll give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.